welcome back to another episode of Immunology, the war is over the clinical conditions. This one is all about hereditary angioedema, a potentially life-threatening condition which could sneak into your exams. In this tutorial, we will be learning what on earth is hereditary angioedema, how might this condition show up in your clinical practice, and how do you diagnose and treat this condition. And to keep you entertained, I thought it would be super fun to create a one-page summary as we go. You can grab the final diagram using the link below, or just grab a piece of paper and scribble along. If you want to take this a step further, you can hit the pause button right now, write down everything you know about this subject before moving on, that way you'll be primed and ready to receive all of the juicy learning. Okay, so... We're going to fill in this sheet with a lot of facts about hereditary angioedema. But if you take nothing else away from this tutorial, this is what you need to know. Hereditary angioedema is a rare genetic condition in which there is a C1 inhibitor deficiency. It results in intermittent angioedema, which can affect various parts of the body and can be life-threatening if it affects the airway. This condition is driven by bradykinin, not histamine. And because there's no histamine, there's no itch and no urticaria, which is helpful in differentiating this condition from other things. And because there's no histamine involved, things like antihistamines, steroids, and even adrenaline are not necessarily going to be helpful. What is helpful when you encounter a hereditary angioedema situation is infusing C1 inhibitor. And last but not least, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in these patients because these drugs reduce the breakdown of bradykinin and this is bad when bradykinin is unregulated. Okay, message received. This condition is driven by bradykinin, not histamine. Do not give an ACE inhibitor but do give C1 inhibitor. Got it. Now, let's unpack this further, answering those questions as we go. Question one, what on earth is hereditary angioedema? Hereditary angioedema is a rare genetic condition which results in C1 inhibitor deficiency and affects around one in 50,000 people. The genetic mutation responsible occurs in the serping one gene and over 400 variants have been described. The condition is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, so both males and females are affected, and each affected person has a 50% chance of passing this condition on to their offspring. Usually, there will be a clear family history of hereditary angioedema, but it can occur de novo too. There are two classifications of HEA, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 accounts for 85% of cases. These patients have a shortened or misfolded C1 inhibitor. So the molecule is sort of mangled and it can't be effectively secreted from the cell in which it's made. Type 2 accounts for the remaining 15% of cases. This time the molecule looks like a C1 inhibitor, but the biologically active site is impaired. So it looks great, but it's not functional. Outside of these genetic issues, there are small print situations where someone might generate an autoantibody against their C1 inhibitor, but those cases are pretty rare. Now, something I love about the C1 inhibitor is that it does exactly what it says on the tin, and then some. It does indeed inhibit C1 in the complement cascade, but that's not the only thing it does. The C1 inhibitor does so much more than that. To really appreciate this, we must first acknowledge that complement is not the only proteolytic cascade we have in our circulation. We also have the coagulation cascade, the contact activation system, and another cascade that you may or may not be familiar with known as the calocrine kinin system or KKS. And the KKS is where bradykinin is born. Now, the good news is that we don't need to know about all the cascades in detail, but we do need to know that they exist and that they interact with each other. The complement and coagulation systems are pretty mainstream medical know-how, but the contact activation system and the KKS may be less familiar. So let's check these out in turn. 
In the KKS, high molecular weight kininogen is transformed to bradykinin by an enzyme known as calocrine. And bradykinin is a potent inflammatory molecule which can alter our vascular permeability, leading to vasodilation and edema where needed. The contact activation system is sparked when factor 12 comes into contact with a foreign surface, and this occurs independently of the traditional coagulation cascade. The best way to conceptualize this is in haemophiliacs. People who are deficient in factor A or 9, they have serious difficulties clotting their blood. But if you took their blood and placed it on a glass surface, it would partially clot. And that's because of the contact activation system, where factor 12 on a foreign surface promotes coagulation, promotes thrombin formation. Okay, so that's all the cascades accounted for. But what does this have to do with the C1 inhibitor? The C1 inhibitor has inhibitory roles in every proteolytic cascade that we have. And because all of these cascades are entangled, it doesn't have to work too hard to do this. Inhibiting one thing will have a knock-on effect on the others. Without getting too caught up in the web of cascades until our brains explode, all you need to know is that C1 inhibitor is broadly involved in cascades at large, and without it, bradykinin production will go unregulated. And unregulated bradykinin can lead to angioedema. And that brings us nicely to question two. How does this condition show up in our clinical practice? Patients with hereditary angioedema suffer from localized swelling during flares of the condition. Typically, this will manifest with non-pitting edema, which is asymmetrical and disfiguring. And because the swelling is driven by bradykinin and not histamine, there's no associated urticaria and no itch. In saying that, around a third of patients may have a rash which precedes the swelling, and they may also describe a prodrome of tingling, discomfort, fatigue or weakness prior to the angioedema itself. And because bradykinin production is not limited to the skin, there may be organ involvement too. So in the GI tract, this might manifest as abdominal swelling and pain. Less commonly, other organs are affected, including the genitals, muscles, joints, and even the bladder. Of course, the most dreaded location of angioedema is around the airway. This can be deadly. And whilst laryngeal involvement accounts for less than 1% of all attacks, each person with hereditary angioedema has a 50% chance of developing this in their lifetime. So whilst most people with hereditary angioedema are going to present with swelling that doesn't involve their airway, those lifetime statistics are not exactly comforting. Patients with hereditary angioedema tend to present in childhood, typically around the age of 8 to 12, and the condition can worsen during puberty. Into adulthood, the condition has varied severity, coming and going as they move through life, and is precipitated by various triggers such as infection, medical and dental procedures, and even stress. Okay, so that's what to expect in a lifetime of hereditary angioedema. But how do you diagnose and treat this condition? As we mentioned, there is usually a family history of the condition. Family members are screened and the diagnosis can be established. Affected individuals may wear a medical alert bracelet, which is immensely helpful in times of emergency. But of course, a brand new presentation of hereditary angioedema is going to take a clever doctor human like you to clinch the diagnosis in a jiffy. To establish the diagnosis of hereditary angioedema, we can send off a C1 inhibitor assay. If this is low, then the diagnosis is confirmed. Now, the key thing to recognize here is that it's not a complete absence of C1 inhibitor. It's a low functional amount of the enzyme, which clinches the diagnosis. For health, we need around 40% of our C1 inhibitor to be in working order. And people with hereditary angioedema typically have around 10 to 30% of functional C1 inhibitor in their circulation. And this is why these patients can be doing just fine, going about their day-to-day -day lives completely normal, and then suddenly in the face of an infection or a medical procedure, they quickly use up what little C1 inhibitor they have and bradykinin production gets out of hand. 
In addition to a C1 inhibitor assay, we also send off C4 levels, which represent the activity of the classical and lectin pathways of complement. If there's insufficient C1 inhibitor, you might find that the C4 is low because complement is overactive and C4 is being used up. A low C4 is not specific to this condition, but it does lend support to the diagnosis in the right context. Now, what's important to acknowledge here is that although a low C4 would suggest that the classical pathway of complement is active, it doesn't mean that the complement system is going to be causing harm to this individual because there are so many other complement inhibitors which are wildly capable of switching off the complement cascade and so having a deficiency in C1 inhibitor doesn't lead to complement mediated disease per se. Similarly, we can apply this to coagulation. Patients with hereditary angioedema have normal blood clotting and they do not have an increased risk of thrombosis. So the complement and coagulation cascades have so many checks and balances beyond the C1 inhibitor that they do just fine without it. But when it comes to bradykinin production, the C1 inhibitor is the main off switch and bradykinin wreaks havoc without it. And you might be wondering, what about genetic testing? This is a genetic condition, right? And we said before that these patients usually have a mutation in the serping one gene, and this is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. And because this condition has a 50% lifetime risk of laryngeal swelling, the stakes are high and it's important to identify individuals with this condition. But we don't need to do genetic testing to do this. Our trusty C1 inhibitor assay will give us the answer we need. So genetic counselling and identifying family members is for sure relevant in this group. But genetic testing itself is not usually necessary. Okay, so now we can diagnose hereditary angioedema in our patients and their family members. Now, let's take a look at how we treat this condition. We said before that this condition is not driven by histamine and it doesn't respond well to antihistamines, steroids, or even adrenaline, which is scary stuff. Of course, in an emergency situation, if someone presents with what appears to be anaphylaxis with no prior diagnosis of hereditary angioedema and you're reaching for all of these drugs and you're not winning, you might want to reach for a C1 inhibitor and give it a try. And in terms of their chronic management outside of emergency situations, there are a number of treatment options which immunologists might use depending on how troublesome their symptoms are. Now, given that you and I are not practicing immunologists, we're not going to need the fine details about this. But basically, in the toolbox, there's the C1 inhibitor itself. This can be given either intravenously or subcutaneously as well as a host of other medications which can reduce bradykinin production or block bradykinin at its receptor. And these medications will be used differently depending on that person's situation and how troublesome the angioedema is. So some patients are on long-term preventative therapy, whilst others only use prophylaxis prior to known triggers like medical or dental procedures. And some patients keep the medications handy so they can take it on demand when they need to. And whilst all of that is super specialist territory, something all of us doctor humans must have top of mind is that ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in hereditary angioedema because they block the breakdown of bradykinin and as such, they can promote angioedema. And other drugs which can aggravate this condition include exogenous estrogens. So avoiding the oral contraceptive pill and hormone replacement therapy is a good idea. Who oh, no. knew? So that was hereditary angioedema. I hope this helped your studies. And if you are a doctor human setting exams, be sure to check out all of our amazing resources over on our website. I'll leave the link below. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you again soon for some more high yield learning. Bye.